All right, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the Action Circle Cycle Political Compass, being guided by Alex Weisenfeld. Today is November 7th, 2020, and the moon is waning during, the time of the, during this time of the month. We focus on forgiveness and surrender and just letting be what is happen. Um, this month of November that we just entered into is also Native American Heritage Month, and it's No Shave November, so you know, we can ride out to the end of the year with no more shaving. Um, <laughs> I welcome you all today um, to our cycle. This is, this is the fourth gathering of this cycle where we're going to be wrapping things up and really talking about how we can utilize the skills and the inf that, that we've learned at, over the past three weeks to have more effective conversations and more effective collaborative problem solving um, and bringing people together with di diverse experiences and opinions and thoughts about topics so we can move the needle forward in solving our core problems and and make progress towards our shared goals my name is abigail twyman i'm joining you today from the home i share with my partner dustin and our dog Ter zeppelin in the community of nockety bay our Alaskan oasis is located on the northern Prince of Wales Island in southeast Alaska, located, located in Glinket Ani, the land of the Clinket people, which they also shared with the Haida and Simshian. I am honored to be able to share this space with my ancestors and the ancestors of those indigenous to this land, <laughs> the land I currently inhabit, who fill my soul with the fire that fuels my action. I am dedicated to remembering forward and passing along the immense wisdom for the benefit of future generations and the protection of our shared home. I'm also deeply honored to be able to share this space with all of the beautiful humans and change catalysts who have been inspired and empowered to join our pod. I'm dedicated to using this privileged body I was born into and this platform to catalyze collective action. And I thank you all for your commitment to acting in the service of creating peace for yourself, your family, your community, and all inhabitants of Mother Earth. Um, I, we are honored to be guided by Alex Weisenfels, and I will pass the mic to him. Hmm, thanks, Abby. Here we go. So, setting intentions. Uh, Action Circle is all about learning how to have more effective conversations around challenging topics, as well as effectively collaborating with others who share our vision, mission, and values. When we come to Circle, we assume the answers to all our questions are within the Circle because we brought the right group of people together with a collective wealth of knowledge and experience. Our guiding theory is that our respective change efforts within our personal and professional lives, as well as our movements and organizations, have had limited impact on the overall trajectory of the data, and therefore it's incumbent upon us to adjust our approach. By bringing voices together and, and uh, guiding the conversation in a new yet very old way, we have the potential to develop plans of action which are much more likely to get us to the end goal, a truly just, equal, and peaceful world, the way it used to be and the way it always should have been. Our goal is to catalyze the spread of action circles across the world in the service of creating peace through collective action. Today, we're wrapping up the conversation about the political compass and the fundamental liabilities, which will allow us to hopefully apply these concepts to frame problems and solutions for people so that we can resolve conflicts constructively and work together to solve all sorts of problems using our combined skills and resources. Let's see, so the guiding compass, sorry, the guiding, um, guiding question here, would be what can we do going forward to to bring people together to build understanding and trust before we begin the conversation it's important to establish agreements that will guide us and protect us within the circle these six agreements are a starting point for action circles and they belong to the circle they will be reviewed at the beginning of every circle and any member of the circle can propose additions or modifications. Number one, while every action circle will be recorded and made public, the stories shared within the circle should only be shared in a way that protects, uplifts, inspires, and empowers others. Number two, we listen for understanding, are mindful of how our words and actions impact the flow of the circle, 
and take responsibility for addressing any hurts we may cause. Number three, we know we won't solve these complex problems overnight and are committed to learning and unlearning so we can be more impactful with our actions. Number four, from time to time, we will pause to regather our thoughts or focus. Silent counsel can be called for by any member of the circle by using the chat function and say, waste, why am I still talking? Or Gelmo, good enough, let's move on. Number five, the chat function is reserved for contributions from those who choose typing. Mm, pardon me. Hmm. Mm, pardon me, who choose typing as their preferred mode of communication and for gems or quotes harvested by scribes, which are any member of the circle. Also, you are always welcome to pass by speaking pass or typing pass in the chat. And then number six, whenever possible, we take a pause before speaking and use sound verbal behavior, e.g. measured and deliberate speech when sharing our perspectives with the circle. We'll make our first round in the circle to establish the agreements and check in. We've got our introduction, land acknowledgement, acknowledge the agreements, and let's see, for the uh, emotion question, hmm, how, let's see, have we done plants yet? What, uh, what plant is your feeling? Not what plant do you feel like, what plant is your feeling? Your, your emotions, if that's a different thing. And let's see, so I am Alex Weisenfels. Uh, I am an eccentric existentialist philosopher and high functioning escapist and an applied concept engineer. And I live in Madison, Wisconsin, originally settled by the Ho-Chunk people. I acknowledge the agreements and my plant, uh, let's see. Hmm. I feel like my, hmm. What is the plant that I feel represents my feelings? Hmm. Okay, let's go with. Hmm, yeah. All right. Um, for now, let's go with IV, just in general. Just climbing up things, trying to trying to be everywhere and and um trying to be everywhere and uh, just getting in touch with all of the locations and structures and everything. And a pass to Mary. I'm Mary Wong, aspiring rationalist and effective altruist, mother of two biracial, bicultural daughters, um, and teacher of English as a second language to adults for more than four decades. <laughs> Um, I accept the agreements enthusiastically and acknowledge the land on which I live now, the land of the Ho-Chunk, but I also like to pay respect to the Menominee among which I, among whom I grew up. Um, I am rather explosively happy today. Uh, it is probably about 75 degrees outside and I did three hours of yard work before I got here. <laughs> um, and so, and then there were election results and I'm just feeling really explosive and warm and like promise of springy. So I'm gonna go with the azalea bushes that bloomed on the Yamanote train platform in Japan when I lived there. They were, okay, I lived in Komagame, and next was Tabata, and I think it's two stops more to the east um, from there. Um, 
beautifully shaped, so in control, but also just explosively vibrant and energizing to everyone who passed by. And I will pass the talking piece to Abby. Thank you, Mary. Um, I am Abby Twyman. I live in Southeast Alaska, which is in, originally inhabited by the Clinkett, Haida, and Simshian people. I acknowledge and accept fully the agreements. And today, my plant, I'm, and I'll show you, I'm feeling like a little baby spider plant. This is a, a little start that was given to me by a friend. And what I love about this and kind of this question is that this little baby spider plant, it will produce little starts everywhere. So it'll start to kind of climb and grow and produce little starts that can be then picked off and play, you know, given, given out or and spread around. So kind of that's how I'm feeling. I'm just feeling like this little baby start of something magical that will spread around and spread some green, green goodness. So thank you. And I'll pass to Alex. Hmm, thanks everyone. Let's see. I was having a tricky time coming up with the uh, the centerpiece and the song for today here. So let's see. Um, hmm. There's a number of different ones here. Sure, let's go with this one. Here we go. This is just one of many pictures involving uh, just people holding the earth. Um, let's see. And actually, as you can see, I literally just looked up world hands. And uh, so this is one of those. And um, I like the rays of light coming off of it. Um, but uh, all of these here, actually, I can just take this back to the results so that we can see all of them. There's some really good ones. Let's see. So I just wanted to emphasize that we have to choose what we want Earth to become through our own actions. So it's important to keep the big picture in mind. And this is part of uh, what I have called responsibility mindset is um, it, there are a number of ways to, to describe it. It's been described as being the change that you want to see in the world, uh, starting, think global, start local, something like that. I don't think it's necessarily um, I don't think it's necessary to start locally, but it can help. And just the idea that what you do on a small scale will create effects that scale up. And so it's important to, to keep everything consistent, kind of a fractal principle. What happens on lower levels affects uh, the upper levels and vice versa. And it's one of those things that I haven't quite put into concise words. So I'll just leave you with all of the images of people holding Earth. And let's see. Now I actually have several possible songs. I was having trouble deciding among those as well. 
this uh, make it a relatively relatively soothing song to close out for the this action circle here. Um, sure, let's go with a classic. Uh, here we go. And so I'll get this set up in a second once I skip this ad. And here we are. Share computer sound. working there we go okay so i won't be able to hear this but we'll make sure that it, uh, it comes through here hmm. so i figured that uh the the Sound of Silence by Simon and Garfunkel is, I guess, uh, I don't know if this is what it was originally meant to mean, because it, it seems like there could be multiple ways to interpret the words themselves. But uh, to me, it speaks to people getting distracted from, from uh, being constructive and things that that will really matter to them and so the the silence represents a, a silence of of a meaningful conversation when people are are talking about things that don't that either matter to them but won't like fleeting trends distractions, things that they're paying attention to, but they don't really fulfill them. So at least that's what uh, what it means to me. And so that's why I figured it would be a good, uh, a good theme. And let's see, so we've got the centerpiece and we got the song. Now for this, because we're, uh, we're wrapping up this uh, part of the toolbox, uh, I don't have any exercises here because we can just do a free form discussion, but we can start with uh, how the homework went if we got a chance to do that. You know, it's um, It can be pretty hard to fit something like uh, a discussion on disagreements in um, to, to a week just because there's so many things going on, especially now. Um, so I... I didn't get to have the uh, the conversation that I was planning on, but I got a uh, smaller sort of um, smaller sort of application of the toolbox in. When hmm, let's see, so start with with my example, and then we go around the the circle. Uh, I was oh sorry, how's that, Mary? Can you remind me what the homework was? Yes. Um, have a have a discussion with someone um, about something you disagree with them on, and then just uh, use the toolbox to understand what it is they fear that leads to their position. And then, uh, for extra credit, you can use that to um, to demonstrate to them that you understand them. Maybe help them understand you in turn, uh, just reciprocally. And then maybe work together to to come up with a constructive solution. But really, it all starts with just understanding what they fear and what they value, and then demonstrating to them that you understand it. That's the that would be the first step that you take in the discussion itself. Beforehand, it's usually important to understand what you yourself fear and value. So. What I did, um, I was uh, I was looking at the discussion about uh, the 
about the whole election process going on here on ethics alarms and there was uh, some back and forth and I could see that people were afraid um, like there wasn't a whole lot of trust people people were afraid of various aspects of the process but like, part of that was because of what they were actually seeing and then another part was they were afraid of the consequences of something being true or false regardless of, of whether it looked to be true or false based on the evidence immediately and then the, the whole history. So uh, specifically what I decided to respond to was somebody had posted a picture of um, like a, a Hummer um, and it was apparently the National Guard and uh, they were saying, okay, the National Guard is showing up. This is like, they had better not come near any of the polling places and other people were saying what makes you think the national guard is is there to influence the polls we think the national guard is there because they're afraid that uh, that the civilians are going to get violent and so i and so differing assumptions about the same event differing interpretations of the same observation and so i said all right it sounds like you are afraid that the National Guard is showing up in order to, um, as agents of corruption, to um, for those in power to control the results, uh, as opposed to them being there to prevent turmoil, to prevent grassroots violence. So is there a line that we can draw where if they cross it, then we say yes they they are agents of evil and corruption but if they don't cross it then we're okay with their presence uh, and i suggested the line um, that if they just stay where they are and they do not enter any area where people are voting or have voted or are waiting to vote if they just um, if they just hang around and they don't do anything unless violence occurs first, like violence that's just caused by regular civilians, and so that that was found acceptable, and so that establishes a shared understanding of we all agree that that we can tolerate them unless this line is crossed, and then we all stop tolerating them. And that that seems to work. That seemed reasonable, and it it dispelled the the clash of assumptions. Like we think they're agents of corruption. Like no, we think that they're just preventing turmoil. And so that's how I applied my understanding of the the differing modes of conflict and uh, and my understanding of people fearing those different outcomes to establish. A, uh, a mutual understanding of the situation and a trust based on a an objectively observable contingency. And I think me explaining that took longer than it did to actually do that in the first place. But yeah, so that's my example. Yeah, well, part of the process. I really, I really like that, Alex, and that perspective of um, like validating people's fears and their the and like the assumptions behind them, but then also kind of you know it's like yes, that is a legitimate concern. Obviously, we don't want that to happen, and if that happened, it would be a huge problem. But just because you fear something is going to happen doesn't mean that the even that the probability is high that it's going to happen so it's you know i like i just like that the way that you used it to kind of not say your fears are completely unfounded just but put putting them in perspective it's like yes and this would be the indicator that your fear is coming to fruition but we're, so we're not going to but we're not going to like get all, you know, hyphy and just like, you know, stay in this constant state of fear and anxiety. So acknowledge it, accept it, label it, and then, you know, move on with our, move on with our lives until, you know, and then 
if X happens, we've already prepared, we've made a plan, we've already decided this is the check mark. If it's passed, we'll do something. So it's a really good example. Mm, thanks. And uh, I pass to Mary. Um, I do actually think that I have an example from the past week. I was, um, I'm teaching a graduate teacher training class and uh, one of the instructors asked, are you gonna show the task four video um, in class or are you gonna assign it for homework? And I said, neither. And she clearly took offense. Um, she takes offense at a lot of things I say. And so uh, this was a signal for me to, I mean, I, I don't think I was like consciously, oh, got to get out the toolbox. But I, I did like respond differently to her than I normally would. And so I, I gave a little background and I said, well, you know, Adam and I decided first thing that we weren't going to use the task for video because everything he's doing, he's doing in a physical classroom. And that's such a huge part of it is the way he moves among the students. And we felt like we really have to focus on connecting online, which is so huge for them. And um, so, you know, knowing that, knowing that we made that decision, do you still want to use task for video and why? And because um, it shows how to do group work and group work is a really different kettle of fish right now, even if you've been teaching for years and if you've never taught at all. And, and also everything takes too long. So I'm not, I'm pretty much not showing any videos in class. Um, but she, ha she said, well, he does such a great job of giving instructions and then at the end of wrapping things up and they have so much trouble with that. And I thought, oh, okay, so this is a, this is not the goal. Like, this is not in violation of the goals that Adam and I had set out. That's actually a really, we could just use that part of the video, which is maybe four minutes at the beginning and eight to 10 minutes at the end. It, you know, it's more time than our students would have, but it's, you know, the, instead of a 50 minute class, they're watching just these two little bits. And so it gave us an opportunity to talk about the core value that we hold and that we're all trying to get students to the same place and that this might be a valuable resource. And Adam and I had just decided, okay, skip the task for video. Uh, what are we gonna do instead or, um, and to, to, to revisit that decision that we'd made, um, and I think like we, our focus is on scarcity, Adam and me, because we have full classes. And Jane pointed out to us, yeah, you guys have eight apiece and I have four. I've got all the time in the world. So again, she had, she had different concerns than we did. She, she had the, has the leisure to show them what it would look in and like in a normal classroom and then do a second bit on what it's going to look like for them and we don't we don't we don't really have time to go okay in non covid times this is how you would do this but we can only focus on this moment what we need for tomorrow and it brought it brought up some really interesting stuff about goals about and i kept thinking i was thinking of scarcity at the time oh i'm in a scarcity mindset i only have so much time i only have so many things i can ask of them and she was in this abundance mindset where you know i have time to do this in class or should i be working on pronunciation like she she has time galore so um i felt like i was using the toolbox and I was conscious of it in the moment it but it didn't occur to me until um 
until I heard the homework. Oh, I did do that this week, probably more than once. <laughs> so I will pass it to Abby. Um, so this week, um, the, the book, I think I had referred to it, it's called Blind Spots came out and it's by Kimberly Nix Barons and she's the owner um, or one of the co-founders of this fit learning program. And it's, you know, the, the research that they've done and the data that has come out of their program over the past 20 years has shown that with like intensive interventions and not, not I mean, it just the right types of targeted inter interventions, not necessarily just in, in, you know, intensive in time, but targeted interventions to address like the core deficits in students um, with like 40 hours of intervention, they're making one to two grade levels of academic progress. And, um, and which is just unheard of in, like the traditional educational model and you know the book and this is all it's like this is behavioral science and this is you know research that has been happening over um, the past 50 years and but it's like systematically not accepted within the establishment and she breaks down really like very clearly and with like unapologetically the failure of the education system and the like the like active denial and refusal to accept science and scientific findings and apply those within the education system and so you know i'm on a like i'm on an unapologetic mission to get these interventions and these things implemented within the school system here where I am. And so during a meeting earlier this week, we were having a conversation and this was where like, I finally, I think finally I start, I actually I think listened well enough to hear what the, what the underlying assumption was about why this isn't happening. <clears throat> and it, I, mean, I kind of went like this, we were talking about, um, we were talking about implementing direct instruction, intervention, reading and math programs with these younger students who have, who get um, uh, individualized education services through their, um, in, uh, through the special education department. And, the we were talking about how you know we need to implement these interventions and we need to target target this through response to intervention and the um the special education director said you know we've got you know it's important that we do something we've got to do something now because by the time they get to upper grades it's just you know we've we've lost it there's there's no point and i was like what so we just give up period on students so they like they hit a certain age and if they're not reading writing and doing math then we just stop we just you know and it was like oh there's this underlying assumption that at some point there's nothing more that you can do whatever a student has learned however well they've learned it that's just it and then we just kind of have to keep pushing them through the system and so I haven't, I haven't gotten to the point where I've like, I'm, have had the, the full conversation yet about that underlying assumption, but what it caused me to do was following that, you know, this, um, she's got this, the director is also in a, uh, her administrator certification program, and she has to do a project related to response to intervention. And so I sent her, I was like, okay, here's this book. Here's this. I'm really excited. I'm trying to be like supportive of her and this project. 
Um, and at first we had talked about her doing the project with some younger students. But then when I, when I heard her say that, like clearly, no, no, there's, you know, basically denying the fact that we could do anything at that upper level, it made me realize that like, that's where I, you know, that's where I want to kind of target my attention and my, my conversations with her is that underlying belief that if we don't do something in the younger grades, by the time they're in, you know, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, we've got no learning opportunities. Um, and so, yeah, so that was kind of, that was, um, that was where I started. I just started to kind of see where I, where I could apply the toolbox um, and start to break down what, like what those concerns and the fears are. And I haven't gotten to the next step of breaking them down. It was just, I first needed to get like, get them some information. So hopefully she'll start reading and um, kind of, you know, learning, kind of under learning some of that foundational knowledge, because again, it, what it, what I realized, what it is that it was a clear, like fundamental understanding or m fundamental misunderstanding of the science of learning and the technology of teaching. And if we're going to get anywhere, we have to kind of get on the same page about that and the same page about it's like, we're not powerless. All hope is not lost. <laughs> we don't just have to, you know, fear the inevitable academic failure. And I think, you know, the book broke it down really well. It, she showed like academic testing scores, standardized scores from the 70s. And it's like below proficient for, I mean, it's just stable, basically, below proficient, no matter how much money or, you know, stuff that's been thrown at the education system, there has been like zero improvement. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm kind of like, that's my, you know, that's where I want to, I'm going to dig in a little bit more is trying to figuring out how to break down, kind of break down those misunderstandings, break down those fears, um, and, and have those more targeted conversations. And I'll pass it. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Abby. It's good to hear that the toolbox is helping with framing conversations and allowing us to to spot those uh, those threads or the um, just the the little the little flags that, um, that indicate what somebody is afraid of. That's that's underlying the whole the whole reason that they're trying to push a particular uh, a particular approach over another. Hmm, let's see. At this point, we have uh, reached the the end of what I have structured. So I'm really interested in just having a um, having a free form discussion on what we can do to uh, to have the the most impact on the things that we care about using the toolbox and uh, of course all of the other perspectives and skills and expertise that we bring to the table. If I might, mm -hmm. I think one issue I have is keeping this kind of thing in the forefront of my mind. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about this a lot because I've been sort of sliding with all sorts of rationality and effective altruism thoughts and, you know, reading lists and actions that I'm taking. And um, I don't have anyone that I check in with regularly. And I think um, something that I, I, I mentioned this earlier that I noticed that Alex in conversation will say, Mm, you know, this mindset or that mindset or this virtue or um, this trade-off. And, and he'll just, it, it's as if he's like 
analyzing the conversation using this framework all the time. Well, I think that is what you do. Um, <laughs> and like I said in my example, I suddenly, I became really aware that scarcity was an issue for me and not for Jane. And, and that was the word in my mind. And I'd like that to happen more often that I'm, I'm like, and I don't right now, the only thing I can think of is scarcity. I got to like, look at my notes. What are some of the other things I could be transcendence? You know, I, I kind of need a way to do this regularly where I'm focusing on sort of one thing at a time. I think um, scarcity is really salient with me and everyone I talk to now because teaching um, our regular courses in an online format, the one thing we're aware of is everything takes so long and the students are so exhausted. Like graduate students are always exhausted after like the first semester they just drag around for the next five years and lose weight or gain weight and like never buy new clothes <laughs> and they look really tired and that's worse like it's worse than normal and normal is pretty bad so we're very focused on scarcity i would like to be able to to have a way that there's like a a, a small graphic that I could like have by my computer or something that would remind me, oh, you're on a Zoom call and things are going south in this conversation. People are getting tense. How can, what's happening? Like, let me use the, the mindsets and the virtues to, to think about what's happening and bring this back to a place where we're where we're talking about where we can make forward progress instead of um, just quarreling or getting upset with each other or um, not accomplishing what we want to accomplish. Hmm. Well, there are two things that I use that enable me to to be able to use this uh, all the time, and I'm I'm trying to. Like helping, hmm, how to put this? If we can make it easier for you to apply these concepts just on a on a regular basis, that will go a long ways towards helping many other people use the concepts as well. Because this is actually the like I can count the number of people who who actively apply these concepts on one hand, that's including me. So as for me, I am what I would call a, a saturated perception mindset user, which means I use just observation and perception and I just try and figure out how everything works. And so I'm, I'm obsessed with figuring out underlying concepts because it's, it's kind of my go-to approach, and that eventually led me to discover all of these other mindsets, and I realized, oh, this is not sufficient for me to succeed at anything. I'd better start practicing these other things. But it's, uh, it's still my default state is perception. And so I'm, I'm kind of coming at this from the opposite direction that, that people who actually go out and do things are because I, I have trouble with the application where I have to just apply concepts time after time. So trying to sort of meet in the middle, I would need to practice applying things in a recurring real world context. And meanwhile, I'm trying to help people sort of observe what they're doing and, and um, just have the concepts occur to them. So it's, that's my first advantage is that it's I'm just obsessed with this sort of thing and that has its own trade off. So achieving kind of a mutual balance that's that's probably going to be very helpful. But uh, the second thing is actually much easier than 
than that. Um, the second thing is all of these concepts have, except for maybe the attributes, they have a, a metaphor, a theme, which allows me to visualize how they work, what they do, what they can and can't do, sort of how they tie in with everything else. And, uh, it lets me appreciate how other people do things when I'm, when I'm paying attention. I recognize, oh, this person, like, I may think, oh, I'm a perception user. I'm like, I'm so much wiser and everything. But yeah, but I, they have this wonderful skill that I don't have because I didn't put any, um, I didn't put my effort into learning that skill because I didn't think that that was going to be the most useful. That doesn't mean it's not useful. It's just like we, it's like, I'm just doing what I do because I'm like, I don't think very many people are, but hmm. I think at some point I kind of lost the thread. So I'm going to back up. Um, Metaphors. Yes, I use metaphors to to do all this stuff. That's why I am an eccentric existentialist and uh, a high functioning escapist. Um, so we've discussed it before. We've got the uh, the fundamental liabilities. They've got a four horsemen of the apocalypse theme. That turned out to be a lot more useful than I thought it was going to be. I just thought, oh, it's a cool theme. There, I want to create concepts with this theme. I should probably not get into all of the different metaphors and stuff right now because there are literally like literally dozens of them. So I'm going to stop here and see if, if uh, there's something else we want to talk about first. It does occur to me that this could, I mean, that if you wanted to train people or train more people to um, access the, these concepts, um, they'd need practice. And it reminds me of um, when I was a grad student, I I was actually studying in second language acquisition, but I had a fellowship. And so I had this whole different cross-cultural psychology gig going on at the same time. And we ran two 10 day workshops every summer. And the workshops basically explored concepts um, like collectivism and individualism or um, they just sort of highlighted aspects of cross-cultural interaction like um, we had a disabled participant uh, a fellow graduate student who was in a wheelchair and that was really handy because most of us had lots of cross-cultural experience but very little experience with that culture the culture of of disability and um, particularly being wheelchair bound and having like limited physical strength and so um we built role plays around these things. And I mean, we did these in our own classes, but then we took them to these workshops. And it was kind of fun to watch these, you know, sort of young and middle-aged administrators practice interacting with folks from a culture they were unfamiliar with, or practice um, behaving in a way that was um, helpful but not disempowering it, with an, a disabled student. And I, I still remember, it because you, when you role play, I mean, role play is a dangerous thing. I know it's kind of a dangerous thing to do in a classroom because things can go south in ways you'd never anticipated. But um, I still remember the feeling of doing some of these things and going, Oh, now I've crossed through a room full of deaf people in conversation. I can do it again, you know, and, and do it politely and do it unobtrusively. Um, just these sort of small skills. And then having done that, 
then I feel comfortable in a setting where there are like loads of deaf people because I know oh, if I want their attention, I flicker the lights. If I want to applaud, I do this. If I want to walk between two people that are conversing, I just walk. I don't stop. I don't ask for permission. I just get out of the way. I just go. Um, so I don't interrupt the conversation. Um, that was 25 years ago <laughs> that I was a part of this. So I'm wondering if there aren't um, ways to practice these particular skills, even if it's just, you know, you're in a conversation with, you know, Jane and Adam, and Jane starts to speak, speak very strongly about this, and Adam clearly has a very strong counter opinion. How would you use this? virtue or how would you in you know assess this in terms of the four liabilities and like just just practice uh the the, the skills you know the, the the concepts in a in a more concrete way uh, mm -hmm. that made me mary think of um in when I taught graduate level ethics, one of the things that I, or like one of our, like every class time we had this exercise at the very beginning was to have a scenario. And then the students had um, what their job was every day was to read the scenario and then identify which ethical codes applied and how and they it was and it was a fluency based thing so they actually had to like i was testing like how quickly they were coming up with these things whether it was accurate and then so they would do it, it was, that's how we started every class they'd read the scenario you know reference the ethics code and think and write about like how it applies and kind of how they would use this and apply it and make decisions and come up with an action plan and then i would you know i would gather their papers or they'd come and turn them in and I would hand them from the the source that I got these ethical scenarios I would hand them like the professionals opinion and breakdown of the scenario so then they could read it and reflect upon like oh this was my perspective and this is how I approach the problem and this is how this group of professionals who has a more fluent understanding of these concepts this is how they thought about it and I found that to be highly, highly effective for the students in learning how to more fluently and you know, rapidly apply the concepts and, and um, critically think through problems. Um, so I'm wondering if something like that might apply here as well, right? So having the toolbox, having, you know, having that like the code, right? And then having scenarios that you know, someone with expert level um, knowledge and experience could do their own interpretation, but have that be like a workshop exercise where we're, you know, we're kind of, we're um, teaching people to do that. Or even, okay, so in 2000, I published a book together with a bunch of other people, and it was critical incidents for um, Chinese and Westerners interacting. And so it was basically to help people move into China, which was more important in 2000 than it is now because you now you get the internet and all kinds of help. But um, you could do something very similar. I mean, they're all, they, they all focus on, a, on illustrating a particular concept, but the stories, like Abigail's saying, they came from real things that had happened to the people in the group. Like, different people authored different incidents and mostly it was me um, and but my professor who had a business background had a lot of them that were business related whereas mine were more academic and sort of personal you know interactions with people about you know their what's going on in their head and then what's going on in this person's head and there were always four answers and there were some definitely wrong answers and there were some definitely right answers, but there was a continuum. You like, there was like, oh, that might be the explanation, 
But that's not really a cultural thing, that's a personality thing. We're looking here for a cultural concept. And I think you could do something similar where you're, it sounds a lot like what Abby is talking about, where you have a, a story and people who are skilled recognize what's going on in the story, but someone less skilled is going to be kind of confused. So the way we validated these incidents, we sent them, I think we had 50 different people who are either mostly Americans, Americans and Canadians, maybe an Australian who had lived and worked in the Chinese diaspora for some time. So Taiwan, mainland China, among Chinese Malaysians, maybe Singapore, so that they had this like Chinese culture perspective. Um, and or Chinese people who'd spent a lot of time in the United States, they would also recognize, oh yeah, this is a stumbling block because, and then if they didn't validate with that group of people, we got rid of them. So you'd want to write or to come up with um, stories around uh, disagreements, and it could be stuff you saw in the news. You know, these two people are arguing, but if we step back, we see these guys are taking it from this mindset and these guys are taking it from this mindset. They share the similar values or they are clashing over, you know, like what, and, and then like be looking at, here's where you apply ethics, here's where you need preparation, here's where you need transcendence, and here's why, and sort of the interrelatedness of the concepts would then become increasingly apparent, I think, stories. Hmm, that sounds great to me. And that would, I don't know if I could write a book right now, but uh, it would be good to go around Actually, earlier last year, I think there was a um, there were a few false starts with uh, trying to get a uh, a podcast going. Um, just taking different different disagreements, and then um, the idea was we could bring in uh, guests and just sort of mediate their conversation to uh, to create uh, understanding and trust to build some sort of a mutual consensus of, okay, here's what's going on right now, and we want something that fulfills these criteria. Um, mostly, it, um, mostly it was just the people that I was working with um, didn't have enough, uh, enough time to devote to that. Um, and as for me, I, I don't really have the skills yet to just come up with, okay, here's this week's topic and here's next week's topic and here's the topic after that and just pulling all of that together. And that's not my strong suit I'm working on that, but it's, it'd be better to, if, if I could somehow partner with somebody who specialized in that. Um, let's see. But yeah, that's a vehicle for doing that is the, um, demonstrating it in various situations and then we have the concept uh, that would apply narrative mindset which would be um, how i usually use it is okay here's point a and here's point b and here is the process by which we get from point a to point b and that's the the story and then there's an underlying concept that that the the story and that process is based on. So that would definitely help. So if you could share this project, or if you could influence one group of people. Um, I've always assumed that your main interest is in education, because you're always talking about how you feel education is really broken. And listening to Abby talk, it, it sounds like it's very frustrating K through 12 education. Um, 
is that like, would you want to be sharing this with K through 12 educators? Would you want to be sharing it with education administrators? Would you want to be sharing it with people who do research on how children learn? Because I think those are different moving parts of that system. You, you, I think choosing your entry point is kind of important. I'm sort of horrified by Abby's story, actually. I find that really upsetting that to think that people just give up on kids at, at such a young age. And, you know, and looking at my own daughter who was just a catastrophe in middle school and is something of a success as an adult, you know, like that, is, that has to do with people's patience and continuing to believe in her and her abilities, not writing her off at, because she had some learning issues, you know? Um, so who's your, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting distracted here, but um, who's your audience? Like, where's your entry point? I think it's kind of important to identify that mm. before you take next steps. Well, I mean, the audience is ultimately everyone, just literally everyone. Um, entry points, probably, the thing is, it's not terribly difficult to get people to buy into the validity of the concepts themselves. They, they at this point, they stand on their own well enough so that people say, oh, that makes sense. The trick is finding people who say, oh, that makes sense. I now want to use these to, to try and make a, a big, helpful, constructive change in the world. And that's rare enough just in general. Like it's rare enough to find people who are trying to change the world and also willing to update the methods by which they do that. That, um, that, that criteria narrows it down, or those criteria narrow it down quite a bit. I, I can, um, I'll take what I can get from people who are willing to do that, to, to be constructive and also update the, their methods. And it'll go from there, but we need those, those influential early adopters, I think. So where I, where I think that, you know, based on what you're saying, Alex, like the people, the people who need these tools and who are, who will be most likely to apply the tools are people who are involved with social change, social justice, social activism. Um, and because if you're targeting everybody, there's only a subset of those people who kind of fit that criteria of, you know, ready to be activated or they're already activated and they need to, they need <clears throat> to build up more skills in order to have a greater impact. So it seems like that that would be the target audience because that would not only cover the education piece of it, but also kind of a, a broader um, a broader application across global challenges. Um, so one potential opportunity in 2021 is the other organization that I'm involved with, the Beautiful Humans. They're working, they like their goal in 2021 is to develop what they what they're calling social justice you and it's they the the like the idea behind it is to create a platform an educational platform for people like us who to go and learn and get real you know immersed in um immersed in this world and develop skills that they can then take out and apply to their own um, to their own lives um. 
Uh, I'll have to look into that. I'd like to discuss that with you further here. Um, if on reflection, it I have noticed that um, there tends to be some sort of a disconnect between thinkers and doers because most of the people, like just in my experience, I tend to, to be more on the thinker side and I hang out with other thinkers, but then I also, I also have you know, interesting conversations with doers and they just do things. And I'm like, wow, that's great. But then they don't, they don't necessarily expand their, their understanding in order to change, not just change the world physically, but also change the, the fundamental assumptions on which their systems are based. There's kind of a disconnect there. And that was um, always, I, I always get this wrong. So I want to remember, I think it's um, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland that actually expressed this originally. Uh, like um, the, well, okay, this this paints a rather negative picture of, of doers, but in, in certain situations, it ends up being the case where it's like the, um, the best lack all conviction while the worst are filled with passionate intensity. That kind of gets into the, the Dunning-Kruger effect a bit. Um, but the, really we need both. And it was only recently that I realized that there's uh, all of this ties in with observation mindset where you can get, you can enrich yourself with details using observation mindset, but then you can also get saturated and us continuously learn without actually developing the confidence to apply what you learn and say, okay, if I see something weird, I'm not going to think that I need to learn something else. I'm going to just keep going with the assumptions that I've got and, and my assumptions will hold versus on the other side, you can, if you don't use enough observation, then you get stuck in what you have learned and you can't unlearn it so you get depleted but also it represents um, distilling your skills so that you're not distracted by continuously updating and with uncertainty you can actually say okay yes i've i've got this context now i can i can just go and and I'm trying to combine those and become more attuned to what I actually have to pay attention to, but I'm still getting used to switching back and forth. And I find that it's, it's very difficult to, uh, as, a, as a thinker, as someone who's saturated, to become more distilled. And so I don't really think that that's my target audience necessarily, unless they also, like, unless they can actually do things it's going to take a lot of effort to to get into that application attitude so i think that it would be more effective to get doers to get the people who are who are more depleted to start enriching their perspectives i think it would have a, a more magnified impact to supply concepts to people who already have that that confidence and that expertise and that um, that application ability. So, if that helps. So it sounds like Abby's um, group, humanity. Oh dear, I already forgot because I'm beautiful, beautiful humans. humans. Beautiful humans. There we go. Is it great? starting place because it's people who've self-selected to be more involved in social justice issues and i find when that's me when i'm like all head up and i want to do something um what i actually have to do is go to my sister and i say okay i want i i, I have these ideas i'm the thinker too i have these ideas i feel strongly about this i feel like action is possible i feel like this action is possible and then she figures out how to make it happen because i i don't <laughs> um i think though that often like i need to frame things for her very much the way you're doing here where i'm like no that's not my goal 
my goal is this. You know, that, that would be your goal if you were doing this. My goal is this. How am I going to make this thing happen? And I feel like that's, that's like a really great place for you to, to start sharing something like this. Is They sound like doers or people who want to do and want to do well. And I think the, the, the beauty of this, it, there's a lot about this that reminds me of rationality and how rationality has helped me sort of overcome biases that I didn't realize I had and identify them and go, okay, you're doing that, that thing, you know. Um, but again, for me, a lot of it's thinking and the application comes when I'm teaching and I'm hoping to create a sort of secondhand environment. So my thought would be, you need a product. Like, I, I mean, my first thought was I need graphics like a set of interrelated graphics because that helps me and all I know a lot of other people organize their thoughts around a topic when they can see oh this graphic and then when I swoop out I'm, I'm sort of visualizing a Prezi here you know like a giant a giant complicated interconnected web and then you can zero in on this or that or another thing um then more experiential sorts of topics, um, like we were talking about case studies or critical incidents or um, some sort of problem to be solved in a group, some activity that people could do that gives it a sort of more visceral feel to it. Um, yeah, that's enough for me for a while. Hmm. That, I would like to work with somebody who can do that that um, visual representation because I actually the way I think it's difficult for me to represent ideas using two dimensional diagrams if the um, if the idea is too abstract. So I can do it, but not very fluently. So I'm wondering, so Nancy Salinas, um, who's been here, um, she is a Prezi user and a Prezi lover. And when you were saying that, like Mary, I was just, the, the moment you, before you said Prezi, that popped into my head um, because that like, it is such a powerful tool to like step, you know, step way back, zoom in, oop, knock my glasses off, zoom in. Um, <laughs> and, um, the other thing that this kind of brought up for me was the the application kind of this this makes me think of an applied use of relational frame theory which is you know the theory a theory about how we how we generate our language and so what kind of at the very basics we're you know we learn things by you know having seeing something, hearing the word for it, and then, and, you know, learning other things about it. And our, you know, our brain automatically will create relations and, you know, associations between those concepts. So no matter like where you go in to a thought, like it's, you know, re related to other concepts that you have. And so like that Prezi idea of, Okay, we're going to zoom into observation mindset. Well, observation is connected to this metaphor and it's connected to this and it's connected. So it's, you know, kind of showing that mind map um, to help people kind of create those connections, right? Because like in your brain, those things are already connected, but in everybody else's brains, they're not quite connected. Like, you know, I, I might know this word, I might have an understanding of this, you know, the four horsemen of a, the apocalypse. So that connects to a concept I already have, but I haven't yet, you know, put all those bridges together. And so, yeah, I just feel like there, it just seems like there's something there about you know, using the visual representation. It's an applied, you know, it's an application of relational frame theory to teach a concept but then even more than like the, and then once we have established this concept, 
then now we move into the application phase of it, right? And we can always go back to kind of the basic understanding, but it's always, okay, now how does this apply? Um, and I love the idea of having like those, those specific exercises, you know, you have the foundation, like the concept building and then the application and that repeated, um, the repeated teaching of that. And, you know, when you're talking about like the difference between the thinkers and the doers, the terms I frequently hear from people about like why they're not doing is that um, a lot of, you know, some of it has to do with the, the idea of, um, what is that? Oh, <laughs> like the imposter syndrome, right? So it's like, I have all this knowledge, but I'm trying to apply it, but I don't really know how to apply it. Apply it. So does that mean that I don't know anything and I'm worth nothing? Or does it mean that I just haven't like, you know, I, I'm not a master of this skill yet, but I just need to keep going. And so I feel like there's a lot of people who just behaviorally, you know, have this momentum and then they run into a wall. And then that is like, you know, perceived as this barrier that is insurmountable. And so I'm just going to back off and I'm just going to go over here and keep thinking about stuff because clearly what I was thinking wasn't right. As opposed to really, it's like, no, that's a, that's a wall we expected to run into. And we just need, you know, we need to keep doing, we need to keep applying these concepts, keep on your core mission to break down the wall, get over the wall, go whatever, however you need to get over this barrier, like you need to keep going. And having, you know, having the, like the foundational skills and then learning how to apply. And then also kind of that third part of the triangle, I think, is the, the accountability piece of it. That account, you know, being able to come to a place where there's people who know this stuff and are applying it. And we can have more like in-depth conversations about it outside of the context in which we're applying it to help build those, you know, build the confidence and build the skills. It's like, yes, you're doing it. You know what you're doing. You know, like you were thinking about it this way. I might've approached it this way. That might inform, you know, their next actions. Um, yeah. And getting that, you know, getting that continual feedback. So we're always focused on you know, keep moving forward, no matter, you know, no matter the barriers that you run into. Hmm. I like that. That that breaks it down into three three um, aspects that this whole toolbox is going to need in order to to start having a huge impact. We've got we need a way to present the concepts to people so that they understand them. That's pretty well understood how that can happen. Just presenting the concepts uh, and how they relate to each other, and then an application allowing people to say, yes, there is a problem in which you can apply these concepts, go forth, that sort of thing, because otherwise not only will it be pointless for them, but the concepts won't stick either if they're not applied in some way. Uh, and then also the really tricky thing is being able to, uh, to get feedback on that. And that's the, that's the thing that I think I'm going to uh, to be charging people for because there's few enough people who can who can give uh, feedback. It's like, okay, so here's, I see where you did this. Okay, that's a good start. I think you missed this question about how this other concept applies or you asked the question, but you you did overlook an aspect of it. And that's not that's not a flaw with your understanding of the concept itself, it's just, these concepts have actually existed for hundreds of years. And here's, uh, here's some resources on how people have come up with like how strategy works or how uh, empathy works, stuff like that. Hmm. How can we go forth with, uh, let's see. Oh, and we got working on the target audience as well. I just, I wanted to add a few things to what Abby said. She was talking about how um, about relational frameworks, and that's not the terminology that I, maybe it is, I don't know, it's been a long time since I actually looked at that stuff in this way, but 
with teaching, you also want to, like when you're introducing new material to people, people will say, oh, I'm an auditory learner, or I'm a visual learner, but really everyone is some of all of those things. And your problem with turning the abstract into something visual, I'm, I'm not sure I'm convinced that that's true. I know that your, your concepts are sort of, they're very word-based and, but you have little grids, that's already a beginning. I think, you know, you, uh, some fun graphics with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which that, that just like creates so many neuronal connections for people. And as a teacher trainer, I'm always saying, you know, you don't have to start with the explanation and then the example. Sometimes you start with the ex example and you kind of elicit the explanation from the, the students in our case. And what you're showing them is like, you already understand all of this brand new stuff we're teaching you at some level. And I think with what you're saying, it's so, it's like you said, you, it's not a hard sell. This is not a hard sell. You t tell people this and, and they're like, yes, this seems to me like a complete categorization. It's a, or a complete classification. I, can, I can't think of an example that I can't fit in here somewhere. I'm not going, oh yeah, but what about this? How do you account for that? That's not what happens with this, which means it's a really good system. It's an easy sell, but it's not always easy to understand and it's not always easy to apply. And that's kind of a, well, let's do, you know, let's get, have somebody come up with a graphic for us. And that could be part, I mean, I see this as something where you'd be workshopping. And workshopping often means that your students are going to create the materials for you to use in the next workshop. Um, I've, I've done so many things where like, when I first, when we first start doing a thing, I'm like, okay, guys, what are our goals going to be? What are our assumptions going to be? And then as it becomes standardized, I'll be like, Okay, these are the goals and assumptions that the last three groups came up with, distilled. Do you want to add anything? And, you know, maybe they do because maybe the format in which we're presenting has changed. Or maybe, you know, like I, for the longest time, I didn't really focus on pausing in oral presentations, but it kept coming up. And so now it's a thing. Did you pause? at the appropriate moment, at least two or three times, you know, so that they're thinking about pause. So you add, you're adding new stuff in. Um, and I, I, I think like we're running a workshop with an invested group of people who have a specific goal and like teaching this as the building materials and having them workshop everything there, you'd get some good metaphors out of that if you if you if you ask the right people and I'm not the right person because I am terrible at graphic design but <laughs> um but there are always people in the in a crowd you know I have one colleague if I really feel like I need a better powerpoint I'm gonna ask her every time because she's got the eye and she's gonna have an idea and then I can be like oh, I can execute that I just needed the idea Hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's what I've been doing um, so far is with these concepts. I do have metaphors like the mindsets. Each and every mindset has um, a some sort of classical or anime related element theme to it. Uh, we've got uh, like uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse for liabilities. Motivations have uh, deadly vices, uh, except there's eight of those. Uh, let's see, the attributes were inspired by role-playing games and they're, they don't really have, um, they don't really have visuals themselves because they're more like dimensions of measurement, but I have been coming up with verbs to, to describe all of these different things so that people can think, oh, this behavior, when I think of this word, this is what I'm doing. Or this is this is what this does. This is the sort of thing I need to do. So, I, as far as being able to explain to people, the more I work um, with people, just back and forth, the more successfully 
I'll be able to develop the um, the presentations where I don't get that immediate feedback, where people don't get to ask questions because it's a video that they're watching. So I'm relatively confident about that. Uh, that part with explaining the concepts, I think they're the concepts themselves are pretty solid. The explanations are mostly solid, still getting there. I I appreciate uh, all of your help and feedback about these concepts, uh, just this and the, the previous action circle cycle that I had done with the mindsets and the attributes. Is this, this helps a lot. And um, I think just as it goes, they will get um, more and more refined um, as we get through just helping convey them to different people and different people offer their own takes and uh, their own situations that they use them in that I would have no idea about. And so I think that part will take care of itself. Sort of, Well, I say that I'm still going to need a lot of help, but hmm. Because at this stage in the, the planning process, how, um, hmm. I know I would like to at some point take some time to figure out who to network with in order to make this all come together successfully and, and start having a, uh, just a recursive impact where people just spread it like um like the good virus of 2020 or something something uh, a constructive viral impact um, at the same time i'd also like to help um, build on this to uh, to help more with any problems that uh, that you're encountering because both because that it's something useful to do in the meantime that reaffirms that that this is actually helpful but then also because that will that'll give uh more opportunities to figure out who will want to use these and and how they can um increase that impact I know, Abby, um, uh, were you and I going to discuss um, after this meeting that uh, the workshop for, for your uh, organization there? Yeah, yes, I'd like to. Um, yeah, I'd like to take that conversation offline because I like. This is like this is the thread, like this is the thread that we need to keep pulling on. Um, mm -hmm. because I, I do believe that, that, that we could have a significant impact on the trajectory that, you know, the, the group of people that are, I'm, you know, connected with tangentially who are, who are doing this work, we're very motivated. And especially now in this, you know, the current political and social climate it's like the time like this is the time we have got this opportunity it is like it is time to step it up and really start really start moving and and taking more effective action we're gonna stop having pointless conversations and arguments and avoiding you know avoiding confrontation and we're gonna you know we need to bring these you know, quote unquote, opposing viewpoints, just different, you know, different viewpoints together and have, you know, have constructive conversations. Because <clears throat> these are people, the, you know, the, the topic that we're going to be discussing is like within, you know, within our field, there are, you know, groups of professionals ha who have very, you know, passionate beliefs about, about these topics. Um, but we all, you know, but there's a, a, but there is a shared goal. So I think. Hmm. It sounds like, 
I think I'm going to be using that uh, those three aspects that you'd come up with there: the uh, the concepts, application, and the uh, the accountability or feedback. So it sounds like I I want to resist my own instinct to just try and put together a perfect uh, presentation of the toolbox and then wait until that's all set, especially because it's like there are so many different audiences with so many different contexts that it wouldn't be perfect for everyone. So I, I don't want to just keep like polishing the, the graphics or, or whatever, although we, we do need graphics. Um, it sounds like it would just be sort of a, a continuous loop through um, like the, the material itself and presenting that and then helping people apply it to their situations and then also looking for the new opportunities while at the same time is basing that on, okay, so how how well did it work this time? Based on that, is there anything we need to do differently and who who should we help next? That sort of thing. Hmm. I want to make sure that I have enough time and mental energy to do this. Uh, at some point I'm trying to, to figure out when would be the optimal point to try and make this my new career, that sort of thing. Like that's, that's investment um, that I'm struggling with. Like instead of just saving all of my, my time and energy and being austere, I'm trying to be like, okay, I'm going to spend my time and energy and focus it and, and actually accomplish something constructive. Why don't you guys go uh, start working on your meeting thing? Because I need to get going a little bit early today anyway. So maybe this is a good time to shift to that discussion. Um, yeah, Alex, I, I, I think this is really great. I think it's really worth sharing and developing. And have you, you've shared it on Less Wrong, haven't you? Or have you not? Um, some of it. So. I do, so I have my own site, and then I've been um, very, very slowly uh, writing a sequence on the mindsets, um, just because I wanted to phrase it in terms of less wrong concepts. And that actually has helped me a great deal with understanding how a lot of this stuff works, just more, more conceptually, more fundamentally. And I also feel like you'd get helpful feedback and examples and counter examples and stuff mm -hmm. and the interest i mean you know people who'd be interested in taking it further hopefully yeah. i'm gonna get going uh, it's been this is great uh, what happens next week um that is what a good next? question we're gonna um alex and i are gonna talk about that and we'll send out i'll send out some um emails and announcements because it's still to be decided there's been a lot of you know a lot going on you know personally and mm -hmm. in, and globally and yes. things are, you know things are kind of shifting and i want to you know i want to use the last two months of 2020 to really refine where we're going to take this and how we're going to kind of you know amplify and level up the impact that we that we're going to have so Stay tuned for more details about the future of Action Circles and where, where we're going from here. Thank you for joining us, and we will okay. see you soon. Bye. Thanks. Bye.